Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Milk Lover, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Red Flood, in which we're playing as the good old United States of America. If you'd like to read about the history or the lore of Red Flood, please go right ahead, but we hope you enjoy, in which no one won World War I. Gotta love it. But let's begin with the focus, uh, with rev review military spending, uh, our direction. Well, I guess we can't do a lot here, uh, but Twilight last gleaming. President Mellon's term reaches its end. Before we can begin preparing for re-election, we should take a good look at the general state of the country and see what needs a quick fix to gain easy votes. Our analysis confirmed that the greatest worries of our voter base are the economy, the delicate agrarian situation, and the rise in all of its We can probably patch these last things out to gain the confidence for another four years and we're led by some guy named Andrew Fruit. I don't think we want to read about him. Please go right ahead. Uh, okay. His predecessor was assassinated following the economic crash. Oh, well that's, that's okay, I guess. Uh, volunteer, expert focus, and a civilian economy, not bad. And we are currently in the rep with the Republican Party, the Liberal Republican Party. Wow, we are ideologically very divided. Cool. And we also have some decisions here. Protect essential industries, capitalism for all, stockpile resources for war, which actually that one's pretty good. Annexation events, um, hmm, and return Panamanian lands. All right, well, I do like that the, the flag is animated. That's really cool. But examine the economic situation. The president's rallying banner has always been low intervention in the economy and securing the economic freedoms America has forever enjoyed. However, before we can call ourselves a victory or call our a victory, we should probably see the end balance of our policies and assess what could be changed in the future or even right away. We will begin setting up commissions to bring us accurate reports of our general economic state. Aristocrats take Madagascar. Oh, nightmare in the sleeping giant. It is 1936, and the U.S. of A. has come down from another morose New Year's Eve celebration, and the New Year has brought little to celebrate. One need only take a look around to see why. In the grip of a staggering economic depression since 1929, the sleeping giant of the Western Hemisphere stirs lethargically. The problems facing the nation from titanic unemployment and widespread bank failures to the ag agricultural disaster of the Dust Bowl only have intensified in the face of continued government inaction. President Andrew Mellon remains steadfast in his conviction that the liquidation of much of the economy will produce an overall more competent entrepreneurial spirit. This was an optimistic viewpoint in 32, with enough believers to put him in office over a divided opposition. Then came a catastrophic wave of new bank failures brought about by Artaud and Kolchak repudiating their country's debts over two years. Now it seems outright foolhardy to much of the nation. Mellonville's shanty towns formed by the disposed continue blooming across the country. Local relief efforts to employ people in the public works falter due to failing or falling tax revenue, and overstretched charities and soup kitchens have made do with less for too long. Millions roam the USA chasing what work they can find from businesses increasingly paranoid about investing in a chaotic world. It remains to be seen how, if at all, America will escape the crisis. Yet, with the presidential election approaching, at least some change appears to be on the horizon and it will likely be a dramatic one. Opposing the governing Republicans, the aftermath of the collapse of the Democratic Party has opened the field for a number of ideologically distinct candidates. The technocrats continue their experiments in scientifically managed society, not the only ones in America drawing inspiration from the French model. Emboldened worker movements such as the jobless progressive party have likewise never been more popular. And in the back rooms and offices of the Republican Party itself, party brass debate stabbing their president in the back to put somebody, anybody else in their driver's seat to steer them to victory. Will the political establishment salvage its legitimacy? Or will 1936 herald an ep epical, epical shift in the American way? And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Washington. Cool. And we have no templates. We have no templates. Equipment that you have no template. To. Oh, okay, yeah. Motorized and light tanks. Well, we'll see what happens. And I do know that for the Red Flood USA, we get some certain options to uh, make things go kaboom, especially within the states. But we have the Land of the Free, which is nice. We have the Dust Bowl, which is not very nice, very dusty. We are all very depressed here. We have an impoverished military, which looks quite bad as well. We have organized crime. We have prohibition. And we also have, ooh, a clan civil war. Oh, Madagascar is falling apart, huh? Well, that's cool. And a just disjointed government. Cool. All right, how about the agricultural situation? The results of the commission led by the Department of Agriculture are quite worrying, to say the least. Worse than what we could have even expected, many farmers in Kansas and Colorado are emigrating to the West Coast, fleeing the famine that plagues the high plains because of the terrible droughts that have been affecting their crops. Furthermore, the absolutely Dantesque, Dante-esque dust storms leave the area almost impossible to inhabit perpetually lashed by clouds of darkness. Examine the economic paralysis. 
Begrudgingly, another set of reports on the economic situation is passed under the president's desk. As unlikely, the contents of it will surprise anyone who is a part of the administration. Unemployment still remains above 25%, same as last year. When the stock market crashed seven years ago, the impacts on common investors and banks took the agricultural sector with it, even before the environment twisted the knife on the farmers still working. And then came the bank runs in 1934. Luxury commodities went too, then manufacturing in general, and resource extraction with that. And now, even if there was demand, construction can't find any money in city state budgets dealing with tax shortfalls to build anything. People aren't working and people aren't buying either. The most novel thing in these documents are the justifications used to smooth the bad news. Certainly, Andrew Mellon's time as Secretary of the Treasury did preside over a period of renewed prosperity. Why would it be the fault of him or his presidency if people chose to live beyond their means and take out loans to invest in stocks? When the natural downturn and the business cycle came due, it showed the cost of their incompetence. Admittedly, the consequences have been severe, but in a sense, perhaps the American standard of living is returning to where it should be. So what's next on the itinerary? Agricultural situations, followed up with industrial collapse. Oh, uh, what is this? Radicalism and lawlessness? We'll do that one last. Let's do industrial collapse. Despite our best efforts of invigorating the industrial sectors via a firm laissez-faire policy and low taxes, many American factories have been forced to close down. Only mega conglomerates like Ford's in the Midwest and a handful of others have managed to keep afloat, but now the market is oversaturated with a colossal jobless workforce that will have no salaries for at least a couple of years. The situation can and probably will turn quite ugly. Nothing like desperation for the people. Gotta love it. And we're also training a lot of ships here too, as you see by the naval XP. The Hippo War. Earlier today, Congress voted near unanimously 527 for one against a three abstain in favor of President Mellon's proposition to deploy the National Guard to cull the wild population of hippopotamus, hippopotamuses that are ravaging Louisiana. Fourteen hippos were brought to the U.S. over tw 25 years ago thanks to a proposal by senior scout Frederick R. Burnham who sold to Congress the frontiering idea of ranching for Lake Bacon. It was an idea that just had three major flaws. First, hippopotamus have surprisingly high birth rates. The second, these have no natural predators. And third, they're over 3,300 pounds. Highly territorial and easily provoked hippopotamuses. There are now over 250 hippos in Louisiana, and they've decimated local ecosystems. And waterside communities, private attempts have been ineffective, such as a campaign to kill White Charlie, the exceptionally large albino bull that brutally slaughtered popular Louisiana Senator Huey Long. Well, you killed off Huey Long by fighting a hippo? It's no surprise, considering the terrible impact these beasts have made, that the Congress is so keen to take action in his hope that this hippo war will prevent further tragedies from occurring in the future of the U.S. Good luck, boys. Oh, how did you kill him off? Why did you kill him off? Oh, there goes Japan. Okay, cool, but still. Industrial countries, we don't have that much PP. How much do we get every single day? Oh, well, that's not bad. 0.96. Um, I'm not sure what we got. Theorists? Civil War breaks out in the East? And in Austria? Which... Someone did recommend I should play as Austria and Red Blood sometime. So we'll see what happens. Han is, is Hanley... Oh, I don't know if we're going to stay liberal. Let's we'll put it like that. Let's just say we might not stay liberal. So we'll see. And it looks like parts of uh, China are falling apart as well. Hunt down Bonnie and Clyde. The extent of the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl. The hole in the country's heart. The cause of so much internal refuge or migration for work. We know how the story by now. Over-cultivation of the land left the American heartland vulnerable to soil erosion and depletion, and when a drought struck at the beginning of our present crisis, everything went haywire at once. So much land is now effectively unfit for mining, or farming, and to make matters worse, strong winds whip clouds of topsoil up into horrifying black blizzard dust storms. The result has been a widespread flight of disposed farmers from the heart of the country to the overlying states, especially California, but under the current economic circumstances, no safe haven really has resources to house and take care of these people. Not that they should con concern themselves if the glut of labor arriving is too proud to work for what's available. The question was posed. After the country's spanning Black Sunday dust storm last year, has the situation improved? With the damage remaining severe in parts of Oklahoma, Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, Texas, and New Mexico, the answer is a resounding no. Managing the impact of food production and the outflow of production from the or population from the region has remained a blight on our economy since. With any luck, however, some enterprising professionals will be able to pick up the pieces from failed farmers in the near future. The situation was posed after the country spanning Black Sunday's dust storm last year. Has the situation situation improved? With the damages remaining severe in parts of Oklahoma, Nebraska, Colorado, and those other states, the answer is a resounding no. Managing the impact on food production and the outflow of population from the regions remain a blight on our economy with sense. With any luck, however, some enterprising professionals will be able to pick up the pieces from failed farmers in the near future. No doubt lasts forever. Moving on to radicalism and lawlessness. Many workers who had laid off their jobs in factories had already begun to turn 
to petty crime many years ago. But now the situation is completely out of control. The Plains immigrants to the West Coast and Midwest have also found themselves in this situation, and coupled with the rise of political radicalism, it has been a recipe for disaster. Gunslingers patrol entire neighborhoods in the name of organized crime, and some reports go even as far to suggest many political parties have begun forming their own armed wings in secret. If we cannot fix this immediately, it will prove to be our undoing. Oh boy. Undoing? Let's not undo ourselves here. We have time for that. Hey, Chicago's here. Detroit? No major cities in the south compared to Chicago, which is pretty normal. A blue drought. Oh, look at that. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Who cares? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, can we get out of civilian economy? Ooh, we cannot. Oh, we're so close. We need a little bit more world tension. Please, world, go explode. Volunteer. We have enough population as well. Famine in somewhere in Russia. Okay. The wounds we still carry. Mr. President, the Secretary of the Treasury has received the industrial report we commissioned. Over the past seven years, industrial capacity nationwide has contracted by 60%, rising as high as 80% in eastern Ohio and northern Illinois. Sir, this can no longer be classified as a simple depression. This is the gosh darn fall of Rome. Sir, we need to act immediately. Something must be done to rescue these areas economically. The high-skilled, productive, high-paying jobs can't be replaced by agricultural work, especially with the situation in the interior. Parts of the country are going to have their standard of living regress 50 years if we don't step in. Please, sir, just do something. I hear you, but we cannot risk worse. Reckless intervention. Cool. I see. Oh. <laughs> the negotiations fall through. Well, that's good. Ain't that great? The end of the five families. Final operations. Continue with enforcement and prohibition. Deal with the prohibition party. Restart the alcohol trade. America is a somber nation. Sober nation, not somber. Pan's ideals. Ooh, look at that. And Eisenhower's firepower. MacArthur's strategy, Maggie. Cool. That looks really cool. Oh, what do we have here? Um, maybe give more war support right now. Might not be a bad idea, so we can do some more stuff. But we'll see what happens. So we've got some planes here. That are already seems pretty useful. Um, anything over here? It is still 36, of course. Uh, let's get some carrier fires because we are making some carriers as well, so that'll be good. That's fine. Sw swap it over to normal fighters. That'll be good, yeah. And there goes the Kingdom of Korea. Goodbye, Korea. We're making some arty. We need way more guns. Oh, we have no templates on these guys. Ismay Incense. The long way to English language version of Ismay Incense. Original French style Ismay Incense. The French made so called Baguette Western has finally reached the US. Fast paced action, sexual themes, and disturbing levels of violence has made the genre quite popular among the public despite public outcry from both moral guardians and political left calling for their banning. The movie is a departure of sorts for the genre as instead of a classic Old West setting, it features near future lawless wasteland dominated by futuristic cowboys riding automobiles instead of horses. But the change of setting didn't seem to alienate the audience as cinema owners are claiming record sales. Allow the movie? Ban the movie? Let's allow the movie. That sounds like fun. And we'll be going with Courtney Hodges, because we can. A roiling, boiling America. No intelligence support is necessary to grasp that America is facing incipient instability as a result of the economic situation. One we'll only need to look at the news to see that communist accelerations and rural militancy is driving major political parties in this year's coming elections. Clashes between labor organizers and private security have periodically flared up over the past few years, not to mention between different party supporters, paramilitaries perhaps. The picture of our various federal intelligence agencies are giving us uncomfortably muddled, leaving much of our information to be sourced from the press. There is a risk that the public discontent with our government could boil over into attempted revolt against us and the republic itself, if we know what is correct. Petty crime, too, has skyrocketed. While some of the more notorious criminals of the period, bank robbers, bootleggers, murderers, have been apprehended by our Bureau of Investigation, there still remains others that have no luck tracking down. The sudden disappearance of the quasi-celebrity bank robber Don Gil John Dillinger after running with the BOI agents years ago, provided an unsatisfying end to that public odyssey, needless to say. It's likely that the structure of federal law enforcement needs some streamlining in the near future. Given these failings, however, one wonders if the U.S. government should turn to innovative party or private secretary companies such as the Pinkertons to restore order in certain cases. When prosperity returns, so too will come. Moving on. Nice. Oh, and Chris falling into the door again. Cool. A light but firm hem. Not to worry, we can still salvage this. We must act quickly and put a swift end to the social malaise before it gets out of hand, or worse, before others do. Finding a solution to all these problems might not be hard, but actually following through with it might prove a real challenge. It might just prove a real challenge. Oh, we do have... Ooh. Oh, we can go to... Yes. 20% better uh, construction speed? Sign us up and more factories? Yes, please. I see. What else do we have here? Head of military... We saw that one earlier. Interior? Back from backstabber. Uh, okay, not bad, not bad. Who else do we have for economic minister? Alf Landon, nice. La Folla Jr., okay. 
Maybe we'll see. Morgenthal, he sounds familiar. I think I've heard of him before. The negotiations fall through, though. <clears throat> It appears that, predictably, the hope of opening up more trade with the Commonwealth has been dashed. Not for lack of trying, of course. In the end, our plans fell apart quickly due to, due to internal and external opposition. Primarily, Congress has had a field day with our efforts. The fear of British manufacturing and resource extraction competing with already strained American companies proved per proves protectionism is still alive and well. The jobless progressive party was ripe with denunciations on behalf of urban workers, while the American party was equally vo vociferous. Oh, I can't even speak right now. Vosservers around the potential impacts on American farmers. The technocrats, after some deliberation, issued a unanimous condemnation on the basis of us allegedly having all America needs to prosper in our own hemisphere. And then, of course, President Mellon's own connections to the Alcoa Corporation. <clears throat> especially given how it would benefit from planned trade with Canada, were scrutinized by the press and in some capacity by everyday party. The reluctance was echoed by our counterparts in Britain, while the Commonwealth also being protective of its markets and in some corners worried about foreign influence chipping away imperial loyalty, our offers were rapidly rebuffed. Furthermore, as more governments have fallen into extremism in past years, or in the case of India, imploded it entirely, the desire to avoid relying too much on foreign trade is growing ever stronger than ever. It seems the total effect of our initiatives have been mostly to embarrass the government. Darn it, now I'm actually mad. Oh, Kolchak is gone. Bye, Kolchak. <clears throat> and Russia is doing the summer coup. All right, well, the bear rips itself apart. It seems like everyone's killing it themselves here. And that's okay. Modify the government? Now we're okay. We're kind of okay. It's hard to see. It's hard to tell whether you have something you can modify. There, You can barely see it, though, by the light around here. Just barely see it. Oh, we don't use the staff. Okay. No chiefs here, huh? All right. Cool. But after a light, but from hand, blood on the sheets? Not streets, but sheets? Okay. That's kind of, hmm, I don't know about that. This morning, a gruesome discovery shocked Detroit, Michigan. An author and noted clan associate, Ernest Sevier Cox, was found dead at a hotel where he was staying in, during his latest book tour. An unknown attacker broke into his room during the night and viciously assaulted him with a baseball bat, inflicting injuries to the head so severe that positive body identification could only be achieved through body measurements. The motive and identity of the attacker are unclear, but it mysteriously as disclosed by a maid who found his corpse in the morning at the nightstand. Lied a... Mickey Black Mike Cochran baseball card. When asked for any possible leads, owner of the hotel said, If I was guessing, it was probably one of those gosh darn Negroes he was hanging around good riddance. Indeed, Cox was deeply involved with Marcus Garvey and his Black Star line and served as an mediator between them and the clan. Garvey himself was quoted calling him a good friend and claiming that this white man had done wonderfully well for the Negro and should not be forgotten. That would be enough books from him. Open for business? Yes. Perhaps we've not eased the process of average Americans setting up small businesses as much as we thought we did. We must promote a renaissance of the little middle class to kickstart the economy, avoiding direct intervention as much as possible. Even lower taxes and some benefits for the self-employed might do the trick. Maybe. We'll see. Alright, 36. I do want to use cast for this campaign. We'll see what happens with that, obviously, but... Uh, actually, what, what type of ships do we have? A lot, we have a few carriers. A lot of battleships, though. Uh, I think I might just want to go with carriers for this one, though. Carriers are really good. So we have them, we might as well use them, right? We might as well use them. But hey, at least we got 35 day focuses. I'm happy about that. Final liquidation. Everything must go. Oh, uh, the mystery deepens. Police checking on Detroit. Uh, apartment owned by the baseball star Mickey Cochran. Given his loose association with the murder of Ernest Severe Cox was up for a surprise. What was supposed to be routine interrogation spiraled out of control rather swiftly. At 8, p at 8 local time, is it p.m. or a.m., two police officers arrived at the house and knocked on the door. They were answered by a gunfire from inside the house, an accurate and frantic but nonetheless surprising attack forced the policemen into the standoff. After nearly four hours in arrival for backup, the shooter agreed to be apprehended willingly. He turned out to be none other than Mickey Cochran, amidst what appeared to be a mental breakdown and covered in numerous bruises. He is now under police custody. Every good American should take home defense seriously. Yes. Wait for rock bottom. The president was still unusually sharp for his age, given everything ascribed to him. That's why Vice President Wil Wilkie was still holding out some hope that he would be that he would see reason. The new survey of the problems facing America was probably too little and too late, but what that it was done was a sign of something surely. This was on window Wilkie's mind as he was standing in the Oval Office. Though, good lord, you'd think after over three years he would have gotten used to the seagrass color that Taft put in. It was still almost deliberating, or de debil debilitating, uh, to stand in the middle of course. Uh, middle of. Of course, Andrew Mellon didn't seem to reflect any of his discomfort. The VP felt a tinge of resentment towards watching him nonchalantly writing something or other that he'd been working on before he was asked to chat. No time like the present. 
Well, what's our course of action from here on, Mr. President? There's a movement in the party to... He chose his words carefully, trying to frame the issue in a way the old man wouldn't reject out of hand. To undercut the socialists by at least stepping up relief for the productive businesses that are sitting idle. Get the economy moving by helping the job creators. That sort of thing. Admittedly, after all this time, the former corporate lawyer still hadn't felt out... But still hadn't felt out how to best approach Mellon. And he had a record of failed pitches to prove it, though he, he thought bitterly. There was a pregnant pause. The octogenarian slowly set his pen down and clasped his hands together. Crap, crap, crap. The cycle, the business cycle, Mellon intoned, hasn't run its course yet. Silence. The president continued. Firm as usual, even if the ravages of time had done their work to his voice. What are we presiding over? Is a liquidation, a liquidation of the less competent enterprises from the national economy, a natural part of the cycle. When the rottenness is finally purged out of the system, what's a, then a better, more agile class of entrepreneur will pick up the pieces. Wilkie was barely listening. I was already thinking back to the conversation he had over surreptitious surrep drink with someone after the 1934 midterms. Something about thinking about the future of the party. You understand, don't you? The president was working on a proposal for a national gallery of art dedicated in his name. I, I need to go. I'm afraid I've got a migraine. Oof. Oh, okay. Well, good Good luck, Uganda. You're going to need that. There are elevations. Revelations. In the police custody, Mickey Cochran received medical help and started to see or started to what he considers actual chain of events. Some mysterious black-clad man were to kidnap him when he was going back from a bar, tortured him, driven him to a bound from places and places before kidnapping, forcing him under threat to him and his loved ones to bludgeon a random stranger to the death with a baseball bat. While does, the description indeed seems to fit the crime scene, as according to a psychiatrist present during the interrogation, ghostly apparitions were just a figment of an imagination and bouts of psychotic break. Sport does horrible things to human minds. Cool. A new deal with Britain? Our brothers from beyond the ocean, the English, seem to be doing well enough to spite the heck hole that Europe has become. Maybe we can make some see the benefit of an even greater cooperation with the U.S. and possibly even teach us a thing or two about keeping afloat in such difficult times. Also, I do want to let you know we are on historical. Because I, I don't play Red Flood enough for me to know what is historical, so we're on historical right now. So Spain. Oh. That's cool. Spain always has to have a civil war. Here lies half of Spain. It died the of the other half. And we, oh, we can go there, but we really need to right now. It's going to take a while to get to partial mobilization as well. Imperial Japan survives. Well, good, good job, Imperial Japan. Ah. Cool. So we can actually probably send volunteers if we really wanted to. But shots in the dark. Columbus, Georgia. Why it started as a standard meeting of the local clan chapter turned into a massacre. Clansmen, with many of their families, gathered on a farm on the outskirts of the city to perform their traditional ceremonies and socialize. The group of some 200 might have been confused for participants in any standard social event if not for their clan robes. Aside from the standard draws of boring speeches and the oaths that there was live music, as well as food prepared by the chapter's women's wing and massive amounts of fresh lemonade. Celebrations last until a late evening when, when without any warning, crowd found itself under attack by yet-to-be-identified perpetrators. According to witness testimonies, a group of between three to six men, all clad in black cloaks, began shooting at gathered with an assortment of firearms, supposedly including an automatic rifle. Despite swift return of fire by the always-armed clansmen, none of the offenders were hit, and most likely because of the low visibility. Before attackers escaped, 14 clansmen were dealt with were dealt with mortal wounds, and further 31, including at least two women, were seriously injured. Police are perplexed by the occurrence, but promises to solve the mystery as soon as possible, mostly to avoid any revenge killings. What could have done? What could have been done about that? Well, we're liberals right here. And these guys are national front. It's, Jesus. Wow. We don't really like them. We don't like either one, really. Social Democrats probably can get along with a little bit slightly better. You guys are what? You guys are 18 combat switch, which means you guys are 24 combat width. Uh, we'll take the whole Hawaiian division, maybe? I don't know. We could probably send him stuff. How many plans can we send so we get some air XP here? Uh, well, that's, actually, that's quite a bit. 324. Okay, well, I'll get some fighters. And I'll grab some of you. Get Actually, get a lot of them. That'd be nice. There you go. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7... Uh, go and do that, 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 and there you go. Yeah, Army 3. Oh, yeah, I guess naval bombs can't really do too much there. Uh, there you go. Well, actually... Slightly more balanced. Slightly more balanced. Cool. Are the planes here yet? Not yet. And they will be there very soon. There's a lot of reading for the America. 
sweet Georgia. Today, in a special radio interview, Clifford Walker, ex-governor of the state and well-known member of the Klan, expresses deep sorrow over the loss of life at Columbus Klan gathering last week and demanded more radical police action. These sort of things were not happening when I was in charge. Those men, if you can even use such a word, need to be apprehended and brought to justice. Either police will handle it or Klan will be forced to find those cowardly worms and deal with them in our way. And believe me, there's nothing more I would want to have than a little chat with those dregs of humanity. Whether they be Negroes or Communists, they need to be stopped being cowards and show their faces. The fiery speech was criticized for adding fuel to an already bad situation. Situation does not look promising. A lot of situations don't look promising. Let's grab some of that so we can start making some of that if we need to. And we don't have enough naval XP. We're good on that stuff. Tanks? Sheridans. Why not? Can we make anything else? Not yet. That's fine. Open for business. A new deal with Britain? Hopefully. Lots of tax reading. Dust to dust. Leonard Snee was fed up. In all of his 53 years of life, he fought tooth and nail to live by his life with his own two hands. He worked hard to save up for his own livelihood, and by the grace of God, he had achieved it, purchasing an old bordello from the one Chuck DeWitt and turning it into an agricultural wholesale manufacturing packaging plant. He made, wrapped, and sold the best seed and feed to the side of Mississippi, and he sold it proudly. He took pride in that fact that he had pulled himself up by the bootstraps no matter what obstacles stood in his way, but with the advent of the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, and Mellon's useless policies, he had gone out of business. Now Snee was barely scrapping by, having sold the old building out to some bigwig low for cooperation just to survive. He lived paycheck to paycheck, asking around towns looking for work, which is why the government letter he received was enough to whip him into a frenzy when that dude Mellon and his men had sent out a written fleet of congratulations to all the brave independent businessmen who had helped to keep America afloat. Apparently the government had gotten the word that he had folded, and the letter, letter stung hard. If it wasn't for Mellon, he would, wouldn't even be in the situation. And now the man had the gall to thank him for a job he couldn't do. Leonard Sneed ripped the letter into shreds and let his old throat ring out to a cry of desperation. Gosh darn you, Andrew Mellon. After next, we're going to do a special relationship. Oh, oh. Britain said yes. Oh, we've managed to achieve the height of our great uh, reproachment. Despite our differences in difficult history, the Anglo Saxons stay together like family. Thanks. Two, the London, Washington, Axis, our industrialists and entrepreneurs will enjoy a whole new range of opportunities from Great Britain, and many more Englishmen will begin investing in American businesses. Everyone benefits if they agree. A letter. Monroe, Georgia. Clifford Walker, ex-governor of Georgia and pillar of the community, was found this morning dead in his bed. His wife woke up to see his mutilated body lying just next to her. Miss Walker took sleeping pills that night before because of her insomnia and didn't wake up even as her husband was being brutally murdered right next to her. Despite numerous injuries of the most gruesome sort, some of which were of a rather perverse nature, medical examiners um, <clears throat> determined that Mr. Walker died of a swift blow to the head that was his first injury and did not suffer for long. The report may at least be some consol consolation to the grieving family. As if leaving the butchered body of a respected state official wasn't enough of a message, the perpetrators left a letter on the night time which goes as follows. To the sheriff's office, to the disgraced clowns in white robes, and to all good people of America, may this and our previous achievements serve as a warning to all those who soil the good name of our great nation. It was us who made Black Mike put down the Negro-loving dog Cox. It was us who spoiled little party organized by hand-packed bedsheets wearers. It was finally us who gave this loudmouth exactly the chat he was begging for. For we are American patriots and white Protestants. We stand all against all isms rotting this great nation, communism, Catholicism, paganism, futurism, unionism, and negroism. All of you so-called clansmen working with the negroes, unionists, fish eaters, technocrats, expect us for the vengeance which will be bloody. In the name of God and the devil, signed, here is a letter, ends with a stamp of a skull and crossbones. Could it get any more unsettling? Probably. Probably. As long as we're doing a good, healthy amount of damage, I'm feeling pretty good about it. There you go. Do tons of damage, because we want a lot of that air XP. Oh, it's going up. I love it. Actually, you guys, let's go ahead and boost you guys up, because you guys are okay. And hopefully we get some army XP here. Uh, Leonard Garo? Cool. Maybe we can try to save these guys? That'd be probably really good to do. Probably won't be able to, though. 21% world's uh, attention? Or war support? Um, can you guys actually win there? Yeah, actually, you might. Not? Okay. Go there then. Cool. Go right there then. Oh, you're actually holding out and doing okay then. Okay. Not bad. Can you actually... Yeah, you might be... Mo no. Maybe. Yes. 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 Save them. Save them. Save them. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, the 36th election, which is a super important. At long last, election day has arrived. Everyone knows how important this election is. The last two decades have seen a radical change in the international order and how the internal situation within the states. Economic mishap, radicalism, extremism on the rise, new developments in weaponry, everything to make the next decade hectic, violent, and even apocalyptic. Who America selects to be the president, therefore, is a big deal. From the left, we have James Renshaw Cox, a Catholic priest and proponent of political, economic, and social reform. His job as progressives have gathered a lot of working class support and are seen as a serious threat by big business and even more authoritarian 
like-minded politicians. Then we have Dan Moody, the young governor of Texas, ever elected. The candidate of the American Party, Moody, has solidified his reputation for his anti-Klan stances and his promise of a reasonable and moderate government. The incumbent Republicans, scrambling after Mellon's resignation, put forward Bronson M. Cutting as a candidate. A senator for New Mexico, he's championed a platform of freedom of speech and economic reform, and has been in heavy fighting with Moody ever over middle-class voters. Finally, there's S Howard Scott of the Technocrats. An engineer, Scott has proposed radical policies, including replacing currency exchange with energy counting, the creation of a scientific board to oversee the exchange of goods, and the creation of a North American tech net stretching from Alaska and Canada all the way down to Venezuela and Colombia. He has been the most popular among engineers, scientists, and self-styled intellectuals. The future of America is now in the hands of the voters. The votes have been counted, and now the president's been decided the winner is. Now for... I, I was asking my Discord server which way we should go. But uh, it seems like if we really want things to go kaboom, we might want to go with the jobless progressive party. Picking the VP... As election day draws near, the parties are searching far and wide for the people to fill the cabinet of this new presidency. The VP, once dismayed by John Nance Gardner as not being worth a warm buck and a piss, does have a role to play. They can give the advice to the president and can act as both the president of the Senate and tiebreaker, not to mention the fact that they step in in case of the death of the president. Jobs progressive candidate James Renshaw Cox is two main candidates in the mind for the position. First off is Fiorello H. Lagardia. A charismatic politician, his time as mayor of New York City, saw the unifying of the transit system, saw the building of low-income housing, playgrounds, parks, and even airports, and restored faith in the police and the city government. He is considered authoritarian by his detractors for his domineering style of leadership, but supporters argue that this is merely proof of his ability to pass pragmatic and moral legislation. The other candidate is Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a founding member of the American Civil Liberties Union. She's been a strong advocate for freedom of speech, labor rights, women's rights, including birth control, and even socialism. Her radical proposals for a commonwealth of labor are based on Republican and anarcho-syndicalist proposals. Worry the moderates of the party, but no one can deny her commitment to her ideals or her charisma. Needless to say, this could represent a major turn in the job as progressives. It could remain a moderate social democratic party with Aurelio championing social reform in a more responsible federal government, on, or with Flynn. It could become a socialist party with a strong focus on free speech and labor issues and an axe to grind with the state. At the end of the day, the choice is up to Cox, Lagardio, or Flynn. Liberty shall never perish from this earth. Because if you know what's going to happen, well, you know how fun it's going to get here. But we saved them. We saved the city. Yay. And by save the city, I mean we kill off a lot of Spaniards. Oh, we lost some Spaniards. Oh, well, the Spaniards are killing Spaniards. What else do you know? Hey, we win. Formation of the America Deutsche Volksbund. The New Year's brought with it a new radical movement in America, even though it's November 4th. It's not a new year. The America Deutsche Bund, or German-American Bund, has been established in New York City by a fusion of number of German-American dominated organizations, chiefly the Small Free Society of Teutonia and the set of labor unions of Pennsylvania and the Midwest. The founders, including the former Bavarian Army veteran Fritz Julius Kuhn, have cited a shared heritage and also a new ideological alignment in unifying these desperate groups. It is this last statement that is the most interesting development. Germany's continued division between the Free Socialist Republic and the Prussians have been mimicked along a among a number of the politically active German Americans in the U.S. Nationalist Germans disdain communist internationalism and so on. Yet the organization professes a new line of socialism resembling that of Paul Joseph Goebbels' National Majority of Workers' Party of Germany, merging the workers' movement with a kind of German ethnic nationalism. That this manages to unite what were ostensibly left and right-wing groups is something of a curiosity, but nevertheless, the political field in the U.S.A. is already crowded, and it's unlikely the boon will find a large nation to settle in. Is it some kind of national socialism? Bizarre. Wild Bill elected again. No one could say that these aren't exciting times, at least. Former North Dakota Governor William Wild Bill Langers won the election to take back his position, interrupted by a messy series of trials for an alleged conspiracy to defraud the federal government, not to mention a failed attempt to declare the state independent to avoid being removed from power. The nonpartisan league member tried to earn his acquittal after a series of retrials in 35, evidently, and he has the charisma to stage a political comeback after that. On top of that legal drama, the NPL's resurgence in North Dakota, ref politics, reflects the continued shifting of the current American party system. The increasingly tox increasing toxicity of the Republican brand in light of lack of federal farming relief was the impetus uh, for what was once a mere party faction to run independently in the state. Whatever the results of the presidential elections, the political situation across the USA hasn't likely calmed down just yet. And some people only think European politics are chaotic. The ongoing Harlan County War. If you go to Harlan County, there's no neutral there. You either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. Grumbles of coal miner discontent in Harlan County, Kentucky turned into a minor civil conflict at the beginning of 31, when the Harlan County Coal Operators Association would cut wages by 10%. Attempts to organize led to men being fired and families being evicted from the company towns, which in turn led to widespread strikes uh, action and sympathy, which in turn was met with reprisals from law enforcement and the private security. 
Shots were fired on both sides, and in the end, the National Guard broke the strikes. But this would not be the end of the Bloody Harlan, which, for, with further violence and attempts at organizing being made through 32, only to end in failure as the Communist National Miners Union and their more clerical labor organi organizers never saw eye to eye. But, as the dust settled over the corpse of at least one martyr, charitable organizations and the Red Cross began to take the side of the fired miners, and there were also hoped that the 32 federal election might prove a government more amenable to the unions. These hopes were dashed with the election of President Mellon, and yet the battles continued. While the rise of the Jobless Progressive Party federally helped funnel funds and support into Harley County, as well as to help to bridge the gap between the labor priests and some of the more orthodox socialists, known union membership is still a cause for firing and blacklisting in mines. As for the National Guard, well, after one messy incident while strike breaking in 35, the association knows their political allegiance may not be always well assured. And so the Harlan County War continues without a decisive end, conducted by with protests, intimidation, sabotage, reprisals, and killings. Quite miserable. Oh, nightmare. Wait, this happened again? Um, I can I read this one already, so okay. Well, alright then. Um, I'm pretty sure I already read this one. Yeah, okay, that's weird. All the things just didn't restart here, but whatever. We can try to help them out if you really want to. You can actually probably do pretty darn well, but now... Oh, they, they must have said no, huh? Oh, we got the Cox presidency. James Renshaw Cox is now the president of the U.S. of America. His job as a progressive party shall seek to reform this country and improve the living conditions of the weakest in the country. It shall be an uphill battle, but one that can be won. Social democracy in America is not a faraway dream, but a present-day reality. All right, my apologies about that, everyone, but we've gone ahead and finished off the Cox presidency where we'll do a new day in America. No longer shall people die from a lack of food or water. No longer shall people remain homeless while there are so many houses left about. No longer shall the poor be beaten and their freedom. The new America shall guarantee a better, kinder nation. And currently, I'll talk about it in a little bit. So let's read Side with the Unions. Oh, work with the farmers. Let's side with the unions. We like sippies. We stand with the workers and their struggles for better wages and safer working conditions. That means unionizing, for they are the best method to organize workers and to defeat the corrupt. The government should start siding more with them in labor disputes than the bosses. Probably a good idea, but we've already gone ahead and done work with the trade unions. It hurts our cap and growth, but we get more weekly wars for it. And we also did form special commissions, so our PP gain has gone down by quite a bit, quite a bit. But we did get plus one percent more stability, so we're actually losing political power every single day. God dang it! But I did want to be able to get more weekly war support and stability, so we can go up here as well. So slightly more war support would be a good thing, even though we probably could have waited. I don't want to wait, and we also killed off everyone down here too. So it is what it is. Cool. Hopefully we can help out down here. Uh, if we're social democratic people, oh, social democrats they like us, and these guys really don't like us. So, ah, very good. These divisions, the Hawaiian divisions, we sent a bunch of Hawaiians over here to help out. Actually, how much artillery do we have? Oh, base track, nice. It is almost 37. So let's go ahead and come over here and do some more output. Wait, right, right, because that is a 37. Yeah, I've been playing this game for so long, I can't even remember when we do that stuff. Oh my goodness, I'm going crazy. These guys are 24 combat with, which is not great. I might just go ahead and say, you guys become 40s. There you go. And just double check. We have made the division, which is nice. Well, we don't have that much, so we're going to wait. But with these guys, I don't mind cutting these guys down so they can be more infantry-like. Yeah, I could save a little bit more on guns, too. There you go. Now we have more... Well, we don't have enough guns, but reaching out to technocrats. Of course, the elephant in the room when it comes to a number of America's problems is, is the Dust Bowl. Millions of people have been displaced by the environmental crisis in the center of the continent, where topsoil depletion and a drought have led to massive dust storms that have crossed the entire state. These storms and the destruction of many farmers' livelihoods have only magnified our unemployment and displaced the destruction of many farmers' livelihoods that have only magnified our unemployment and displaced population issues. Whereas the previous administration failed to adequately respond, President Cox made combating the Dust Bowl a cornerstone of his campaign. And now is the time for action, of course. Determining where to even begin with the Dust Bowl has required consulting the experts. The Cox administration has begun reaching out to conservationists conservationists and academia to draft the response, but also on the front lines of the disaster. Oklahoma, one of the states in the affected area, has been a hub of technocracy. Inc.'s work to demonstrate the strength of a scientifically managed approach to America's ills. Their approach on soil conversation and attempts to subsidize our farmers into choosing more environmentally healthy methodologies has, been, has proven promising, despite being largely self-funded due to federal disinterest. This is an opportunity for the new government. The New England conservationists and progenitor of the Appalachian Trail, Benton McKay, has been tapped by the Cox administration to shape the federal response to the Dust Bowl. A former member of the Technical Alliance alongside Howard Scott, McKay should help bring the expertise of these local visionaries into the JPP's program. We could use their knowledge. I'm tired of coughing up dust. New Day in America. Very good. Side with the unions.
and will go ahead and do work with the farmers. The country has left agricultural workers to rot for far too long. This country needs food and we only get it from these farmers. We need to invest in their well-being and protect them from economic chaos and natural disaster to ensure that something like the Dust Bowl doesn't ever happen again, which is probably a good idea. Uh, if you want to do that, you might be able to kill them off faster before these guys all leave, which probably won't happen, but you never know. And we're almost there, almost... Oh, that sucks. You could have killed them all off, but whatever. And these guys are all going to die up here probably too. Oh, they do have a port though, which is nice, but still. Um, you guys can help out there too. That's fine. Cacatus? I don't speak Spanish, so I apologize, but you know. We do our best here. We do our best. Alright, I'm going to come over here because fighting over river sucks, so fight next to the river. Side with the unions. And then we'll work with the farmers. And we have 66 air XP. That's pretty darn nice, not going to lie. I love having a lot of air. If you guys want to do that, that's fine. 22 combat width, not bad, not great, but not bad. We're still getting some more of that. And air XP is just doing great. I love it. Naval stuff. Oh, we need to work on our navy. Oh, we have more six more ships. Uh, these these this navy's not very good yet. So this one right there, that's fine. Train. How badly does that hurt? Feel does not. How about that one now? Keep training. We we instantly went up to four. Five, we get over one at one point. Over 1.1 a day. Wow. But mixed blessings in Texas. Texas, the most popular state at the forefront of the Dust Bowl, has not much to celebrate in recent years. The oil boom at the beginning of the century did much to transform the economy of the state, and while the state was dominated by a Democratic Party that disenfranchised the poor and minority populations, that sort of prosperity was worth noting. When agriculture, oil, and other exports took hit after hit from global economic calamity and environmental disaster to the north, the bad times returned. Texas has been restrictive or restive since the crash hit. While it can be sometimes be attributed to how the state Democrats have blocked other major parties from making foot footholds, socialist electoral power in Texas did make its presence felt in the 36th election. And the labor unrest has been exacerbated by the t with the tide of the Dust Bowl migrants. That being said, the election of the job as progressive party has been hopeful for some. Promises of Dust Bowl relief are overdue for many in the state, and all sorts of workers in depressed industries can find something to smile about with the coming of the Cox presidency. The joy is not universally felt, of course. The upper echelons of Texaco, Shell, and other American oil companies would clearly resent any new taxes being levied on their work or, God forbid, some kind of nationalization scheme. Scaremongering about what the new regime means for a race relations has also made things a little bit sensitive down south. Perhaps the JPP has some work to do to earn the people's trust. Isn't the state motto friendship? Just depends on who you talk to. Oh, oh, yeah, we actually did that. Look at that. Hopefully we don't get in a circle here. Hopefully the Spanish can help us out here, but we'll see about that. Cool. All right, we got some radio here, which is very nice. Ah, the war on Israel. Very cool. Very, very cool. Let's go and grab some radar, perhaps. That'd be probably pretty good to do. Very nice. Very, very nice. And let's kill off some Spanish divisions. And we're building a city in Nevada. I usually don't ever build in Nevada, but that's okay. Speed her back up. Nice. And head on over here. Come on, it's only four divisions you gotta kill. Come on. There you go. Nice. Uh, fighting the mountains really sucks, but you might be able to do okay then. Uh, we do have two, almost three, that's not bad. But after this one, working with farmers to deal with moderates. There are those who still think we are Lenin incarnate and want nothing less than the destruction of American society as a whole. Despite this, they actually agree with us more than they think, so it may be better to work with them to prove our innocence rather than just trying to tell them up front. Maybe then they can stop shouting about the evils of socialism. Probably not. United Coalition. The reformists and socialists have a common enemy, economic tyranny and financial ruin. Rather than let our differences get the better of us, we should unite under a common cause and move to the battle of the parties who stand against us. The people united shall never be defeated. Revolutionary anarchists and socialists? Nice. Very cool. Uh, actually, how are the ships doing? Coal holes, battleships are okay. How are these stuff doing? Oh, actually doing relatively all okay. Destroyers? We could probably improve our destroyers a little bit too. Hopefully we can win here. Even though we're kind of struggling here as well. Oh, what do we get? I forgot. What do we get? Oh, we need a spot more of chromium, which is fine. We can buy that. There you go. From the Greeks. Cool. And we're definitely... Well, it's definitely learning. Definitely learning. Oh, they were just overran. Nice job, guys. Give them some time to heal up, though. That'll be good. And do something like that next. Ooh, deal with the moderates. Ooh, how about now we can lower these guys to 20 combat width. There you go. We'll save you a bit more guns. Nice. Even though we need a lot of guns and garrisons. So, United Coalition. Remove disjointed government. 
Yeah, we get more stability, surrender limit, ideology, drift, defense, and technocrats, and Navajo in conflict. It bears mentioning that the actual implementation of relief programs across the U.S. has run into lo local resistance. Specifically among the Navajo people of the American Southwest, while farmer relief programs and soil protection initiatives in the Dust Bowl areas have not been historically charged, the Navajo do remember the first relocations of the Long Walk in the 1860s very well. Understandably, there has also been resistance to federal interference in affairs since. This is a difficult balancing act for the Jobs Progressive Party. The Navajo rely on their sheep herds for a large part of their income, on top of the spiritual significance of herding practices. At the same time, the technocrats who have proven so integral to the other agricultural aid programs are insistent that the land in the area cannot support the current population of livestock. Ongoing resistance of the Navajo has actually led to a number of arrests of high-profile figures, which has only inflamed the situation. Is this going to be where the JPP's image of egalitarianism and justice breaks down? Is there any mutually satisfactory outcome here? Nah, we don't need that. Actually, you guys hold there. And I want you guys to go right there next. That would be good. Yeah, there you go. Nice. Oh, they do want to break out, though. Cool. Six divisions is quite a few guys, but whatever. Oh, the 37 General Conference. The first General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints during Cox's presidency has served as a stern reminder of who holds the real influence in the Southwest. None. Are the general authorities have condemned President Cox directly, but the usual assurances of salvation for doing the Lord's work. Wisecracks for the more humorous authorities, and warning is against temptation and sin were accompanied by political grandstanding by Prophet President Grant and several of his followers. The Mormon prophet stated that social programs are not the government's job, that such works are the responsibility of morally grounded groups, such as religions and Profits, in his own words. He offered a warning to Washington. The only way to install socialism in this country is to tear down the Constitution and all it stands for. As we believe the U.S. is God's chosen nation in modern times, the saints will fight any such change with votes, if we can, and with sword, if we must. The global impact of this general conference is too early to tell, but in hotbeds of Mormon influence such as Utah, Nevada, Western Colorado, Wyoming, South Idaho, and Northern Arizona, Northwest New Mexico, and Hawaii's Oahu Mormon sector, even members of other Christian sects are being riled up, and resistance to Cox policies may soon enter local governments within the Mormon sphere of influence. Let them talk, angers, but one escape from this horrible depression. And hunger? Uh, we get more weekly stability for quite a... Oh, that's not terrible. That's not great, but not terrible. And the Dust Bowl? As we all first, we get more civvies. At last, the tyranny of the Dust Bowl has been ended. Now we must rebuild communities and ensure that those who are displaced can return home and have work, food, and safety. It'll be difficult rebuilding, but we shall come out stronger for it. All right, if you want to help out these guys, that's fine. Nice. We have even more. Oh, oh, well, oh, there goes Israel. I'm sure someone in the chat will be very happy with that. I mean, if you guys want to help attack, that's fine with us. Since we're on this side. Hey, we're not making any political power. That's better than not losing political power. So, more daily social democratic support. Cool. And we're out of guns still, but we need some artillery. We need, we need a lot of stuff, actually. Oh, boy. The guys at North keep getting their crap pushed in, so maybe we can help them out. Free them, liberate them, give them liberation. And the Dust Bowl. Actually, the Dust Bowl right now, what does it look like? Prohibition, organized crime, 25% and stability, so we'll get a little more stability with consumer goods and hunger. No one should ever go to, and have to starve, especially when food is in abundance. We should create more soup kitchens and providers of meals in order to make sure that hunger does, does not only go down, but it is ended. As we said before, no one should die on our watch when all of the resources needed are at hand. Very true. Oh, look at that. Partial mobilization? Yes, please. Hey, we're actually... Oh, we finished uh, Cal uh, California, no, Nevada. Nice. Civvy, civvy, civvy's extreme. Synthetic oil experiments. Cool. It is still 37. Let's grab some more construction speed. Nice. They're doing a great job. It looks like the other group has pretty much ran out of soldiers to fight with. Or at least weapons or something like that. So, Cap, let's go. Let's do it. Hey, we're actually making political power now. Not bad. 55% stability. Look at that. 49% war support. This is great. America is doing okay against Mr. Cox. Is he, I guess, a Catholic priest, maybe? Huh. And hunger. I guess, yeah, he was, so. No more hunger. And then, end poverty in America. At last, we shall end the tyranny of poverty in these United States. The people shall be able to live freely and without fear of living destitute and penniless. Poverty is dead, and its place as the American nation shall rise. A country built on the sweat of laborers shall finally give some respect to them. Um, I'll be honest, like, uh... You ended poverty within, like, what, six, like, four months or something? Six months? Is that all it took? Just, just simple, just, just any poverty that fast. That's all it took. Actually, doing like that. I was hoping these guys would go over there and finish these guys off. 
But oh well. Radio detection is very nice. Depth charge throws are very good as well. Um, battleship throw case. We're going to really focus on the carrier. So it's 37. Get, we have better artillery. Empty air maybe. That's always useful to get. And air doctrine actually. And we want cast. Fly formation. That'd be good. You guys should be able to do well over there. Um, yeah, hold for now. Hold, 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 hold. Johnny got his guns released. Today finally came out the long-awaited July issue of War Stories containing the last chapter of ongoing Johnny got his gun story by Dalton Trumbo. Stretch over many chapters within multiple issues. Saga of Sergeant Joe Bonham, all-American youth who became most accomplished soldier of the Great War. Within Stories' fictional setting, the U.S. joins the Entente cutting the war short and giving it a clear victor. Adventures of Joe, while over the top, not really ended indicative of realities of European trench warfare, nonetheless did get some positive feedback from critics who praised way higher than expected for his genre literary skill of the author. And of course, audience itself fell in love with the wonder of the 20th century and his exploits in Europe. Bright, brave, and unashamedly loyal to his homeland and democracy, Joe brought a little hope, bit of hope to many households across the crisis-torn country. War Stories publishers already experiencing record-setting sales, and Trump himself said in a recent interview that he was approached by publishers about releasing his story as a full book. I'll sing the anthem even with my mouth choked with worms. Wow, okay. That was a bit odd, but okay, whatever. Trumbo, is it? Is it? Oh, hey, we did well. We got a lot of naval XP too. Republican victory in the Spanish Civil War. Just like the Pericles. The Pericles, Pericles. And hunger and end poverty in America. Part two, cool. Partial mobilization, why does he look so angry? It looks kind of crazy that way. Hey, oh, heroes. Oh, oh, welcome home. And he's dead. Well, we cannot be canceled manually. Okay, then. The nation is in mourning the president's death. The Dust Bowl was devastating to the people of the Midwest. Crops died, water, water dried up, and the climate was harsher than ever. Many chose to leave rather than suffer there, and California saw a mass influx of refugees. The problem is, they weren't much better off. Economic misfortune still ruled these streets as well, and so the refugees banded together and formed communities wherever they could. Cox, as both a publicity stunt and out of genuine concern, visited one of these communities in Fresno to hear the concerns and feelings. Things went well at first. Cox was silent and respectful as the people poured their hearts out and the horrors they had experienced. He had promised economic reform and better protection against the climate and was met with applause. Cox was walking through the crowds, shaking hands and hugging people as he went. But then a shot rang out. Cox clapped into the ground and people started screaming. Two men, clad in black robes and hoods and brandishing weapons, and started to yell. They called him a dirty Marxist Council's Bolshevik anarchist and a race traitor along with that. The police quickly took advantage of the situation and arrested the two men, but the damage had been done. The champion of the poor and oppressed of America lay dead in the streets. His followers knew that God would save his soul, for he was just, but would God save theirs? My goodness, how awful. We're still ending poverty? Well, there's the Senate. The funeral of Cox. The room fell silent as the speaker walked to the podium. Before, people chatted about the loss of the president, their friend. Some cried, overwhelmed by the terror of the whole thing. But not the speaker. Former Governor Grifford Pinoch, uh, Pinchot had backed Cox during his early days, seeing his bid for the presidency as being uniquely progressive and reformist in nature. It was tough seeing him go. Uh, Cox didn't just see America, he felt every part of it. He made his goal to understand the worries and trouble of every single person in the country. And he worked so hard to make sure that these worries would disappear because that was necessary for a free, for a free society. This is why the Legion killed them. They didn't want America to rise forth and be what it can be. They want America to re simply remain white or Protestant or whatever they think America is. Cox showed another way. Pinchot's comments have been criticized as being overly, overtly political, but he defended them to himself saying that it's the president's funeral. He wouldn't have had it any other way. Regardless, America has a new president again, and once more, the balance of powers change. Why couldn't it have been a normal election? So what Flynn is sworn as president. And my apologies for my, my mispronunciations as well in this campaign. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn didn't know when she was sworn in as president. According to law, the vice president is officially sworn in in the second the president heart stopped. So, Flynn was officially acting as president while she was still being escorted by the Secret Service agents out of Frisco. She wanted to scream this poor priest had been gunned down by the Klan all because he cared about the poor. But now was not the time to be upset when, uh, what everyone felt. America needed a leader. When she arrived back at D.C., she declared to the crowd that the Cox mission of an American governed by labor and toil would come true no matter what, and that even the mortal coil would not stop Cox's objective. After that, the official swearing-in procedure had to be held. A judge was found, along with a copy of the Bible and a hardcover version of the Declaration of Independence. Flynn snuck in a copy of the IW W Constitution into the Bible while no one was looking and took her position. As a judge read a statement, uh, the word of Joe Hill resonator had, don't mourn, organize. Wow. She almost got that double chin going. War economy ready? Anybody? Oh, we can't do that. Darn it. What is it? Export focus? We probably won't go to limit exports. That hurts construction speed. So, I guess our guy's dead. 
Oh boy. Flynn's presidency. We've had three presidents in the span of, uh... Oh, there's nothing here. Uh, a single episode. Alright, well, not bad. And you know what? You might just want to boost up production in California. Not saying we need to. Uh, do it there first. But just saying it would be maybe a good thing. Maybe. And what do we have over here? Oh, local militia elections. Weekly war sport goes up. Civilian construction speed goes down. Revolutionary anarchists. Even more weekly stability. Lose some political oh, power. What if we do this one first? We lose some political power and civilian factory construction speed, but get more weekly war sport? That could be pretty darn good to get. We could use a little bit more war sport, right? Oh, there's some actual ships here. Nice. You're doing that. That's fine. I kind of forgot to look at this stuff. That's fine. Whatever. Level 1. I don't use level 1 stuff. Nope. 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 And you guys capital ships? Yes, you are. I... Uh, so are you. There you go. You are not. And you aren't too bad. You're not great. This is really not great at all. Holy crud. Um, level 2? Yes. Anti-air is not very good right now. You level 3 cruiser armor, which is very weird, but alright. There you go. There you go. You can do that. And then you got one cruiser. You can do that. And I do want to make some destroyers as well. So we'll get there eventually. Wow. Well, I guess after the presidency, what are we going to do? Federal or executive order for federal funding? Wow, that's a lot of political power. But look at that stability hit. Oh, aid the dust migrants. We'll do that one. The migration crisis caused by the dust bowl needs to end as soon as possible. They need shelter, food, medical equipment, and work, and quickly. This is an emergency, and we shall do whatever we can to remedy the situation as possible. Probably a really good thing to do. Oh, and we have 15, 15, 3. Not bad. Could be a lot worse. Could be a lot worse. Then again, it'd be, it could be a lot better if our president wasn't, wasn't assassinated. But you know what? That's neither here nor there. So we're going to slow down probably one of these. Oh, that's a lot of... Wow. Um, these guys. Oh, we actually have a sub here too. Throw them right there. You guys. You're three, so just help them out. Having carriers is just super important, especially when you have a battleship as well. Nice. That went up a little bit more too. Orenburg Military District. Or just... Dis yeah. All right. Declare war on them. Community schemes. Let the land rest. Ah, help up. Help. Community help schemes. After we get improved machine tools. And we can do that, but nah. We're going to do land doctrine later. I might want to wait for that. Maybe not. Hmm. Mass assault sounds really good for that. But let's see. So 37. Anything here? Oh, naval doctrine. Might as well. There you go. Oh, more duck? Oh, wow. Alright, so that one and that one. Uh, get... Actually, how are these cruise... Carriers, I mean. Carriers. Nothing there. Uh, that seems all okay. You can actually change any of this? No. Yeah, that's not bad. Cool. Proof like ship holes. We could do that, but whatever. The Hobbit is published. I want a copy of it now. Cool. Flying formation, and then we'll do some more of this, probably. Oh, Prussian Congo. I definitely need to do that one as well sometime. But community help schemes. In order to build a greater sense of community amongst American people, we should begin to promote help schemes. These are ways to ensure that people can turn to their neighbor to help with something, rather than just assuming they can do it themselves. That way, stronger bonds can be made within communities to ensure that they don't need bourgeois or even government assistance when they need something done. Weekly st oh wow, Colla oh we have collapsing America. Oh, dust bowl is a little better. All right, impoverished military, organized crime, clans. Wait, replace collapsing American values with collapsed American values. Oh what? Wait, where's that? We got anti-aircraft guns, which is nice. Um, scout planes, strategic bombers. We can grab that, but I don't want to. Um, well, I guess some of that. No, actually, no. We'll grab some of the better sonars, right? Yeah. Should have got that one earlier, but whatever. Construction 2 is nice. Grab some more extraction, because we can. Because we'll need that eventually, probably. And communal food sounds really good. Oh, uh, yeah. Weekly stability. Plus 2%. Why not? We hurt our stability, but that's okay. No one should be hoarding food when so many are left starving. The government will begin to invest in communal food programs to ensure that everyone within, everyone within a community can go home that day full. It's not the tasty stuff, but it's more than what they're going to get now. Frogs in a flock. Oh. Well, I guess let's end with one more focus. Like, weekly stability seems really good. What else is here? Weekly, st weekly stability goes up. Are we losing stability every week? We're not, we're not losing stability. Uh, this one is... Ooh. I, mean, I guess that makes sense as we're going to hit ourselves anyways. Uh, but you know what? How about I let you guys decide? Should we do Union Dominance? Or should we do Level the Playing Field? 
We get stability for this one. Or do we want more factory output and production efficiency growth? Please let me know in the comments below. But we're going to do executive order for federal funding. In order to get the economy back on track, we need money to invest in the economy and to better the people. That means an executive order to get it so that we can invest as quickly as possible and get back on track financially. The capitalists will sneer, but they got us into this mess in the first place. Now their money will have to fix it. But if you enjoyed this first kind of crazy, kind of weird uh, episode of us playing in Red Flag as the good old United States, please leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue to see what will happen to America, especially if we get to 1939. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!